John Gibson Patton, missionary to the New Hebrides, born on 24 May 1824 at Brayhead in Scotland, was eldest of the eleven children, five sons and six daughters, of James Patton, a peasant stocking maker, by his wife Janet Jardin Rogerson. Both parents were of covenanting stock and rigid adherents of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Scotland, which still represented the faith of the Covenanters. When Patton was five years old, the family removed to Torthorwold, a few miles from Dumfries, where his parents passed the remaining 40 years of their lives. Here he attended the parish school, till, in his twelfth year, he was put to his father's trade of stocking making. Patton soon freed himself from the family workshop, and began to support and educate himself. He put himself for six weeks, all he could afford, to Dumfries Academy. He served under the surveyor for the ordnance map of Dumfries, he hired himself at the fair as a farm laborer, he taught, when he could get opportunity, in schools, and even for a time set up a school for himself, but every spare moment was devoted to serious study, at last he settled down for ten years as a city missionary, in a then very neglected part of Glasgow, where he created an excellent school and put the whole district in order the Reformed Church, by which John Patton was ordained, had already a single missionary, the Rev. John Inglis, at Anaetium, the southernmost of the New Hebrides Islands in the South Seas, and the elders of the church were seeking somewhat vainly for volunteers to join in that hazardous enterprise. Patton offered himself, and was accepted. On the 1st of December 1857 he was licensed as a preacher, in his 33rd year, and on the 23rd of March following he was ordained with his newly married young wife Mary Ann Robson he reached the mission station at Anaetium on the 30th of August and the pair were soon sent on to establish a new station in the island of Tanna the natives of which were then entirely untouched by Western civilization except in so far as they had from time to time been irritated by aggression on the part of sandalwood traders the young Scotchman and his wife without any experience of the world outside the small body to which they belonged, were thus the first white residents in an island full of naked and painted wildmen, cannibals, utterly regardless of the value of even their own lives, and without any sense of mutual kindness and obligation. A few months later, in March 1859, a child was born to this strangely placed couple, and in a few days more, wife and child were both dead. Patton, alone but for another missionary on the other and almost inaccessible side of the island, was left for four years to persuade the Tanis to his own way of thinking. In May 1861, a Canadian missionary and his wife, on the neighboring island of Aramango, were massacred, and the Tanis, encouraged by the example, redoubled their attacks on Patton, who, after many hairbreadth escapes, got safely away from Tanna, with the loss of all his property except his Bible, and some translations which he had made into the island language during his four years' struggle. From Tanner, Patton reached New South Wales, where he knew no one, walked into a church, pleaded successfully for a few minutes hearing, and spoke with such effect that from that moment he entered on the career of special work, which was to occupy the remaining 45 years of his long life. His main objects, in which he succeeded to a marvelous degree, were to provide missionaries for each of the New Hebridean Islands, and to provide a ship for the missionary service service. As the direct result of his extraordinary personality and power of persuasion, the John G. Patton Mission Fund was established in 1890 to carry on the work permanently. Returning for the first time to Scotland in 1863, he there married again, and with his new wife and certain missionaries whom he had persuaded to join in his work, was back in the Pacific early in 1865. After placing the new missionaries in various islands, Islands, Patton himself settled on the small island of Anawa, the headquarters whence from 1866 to 1881, he contrived to make his influence felt. After 1881 his frequent deputation pilgrimages among the churches in Great Britain, and the colonies rendered his visits to Anawa few and far between, and his headquarters were at Melbourne. 
In addition to his special work as missionary, he took considerable part in moving the civil authorities, not merely British, but also those of the United States, to check the dangerous local traffic in strong drink and firearms. He also resisted the recruiting of native labor from the islands, and he lost no opportunity of protesting against the growth of non-British influence in the same places. Anawa is a small island, only nine miles long by three and one half wide. There is a scarcity of rain, but the heavy dews and moist atmosphere keep the land covered with verdure. The natives were like those on Tanna, although they spoke a different language. They were well received by the natives, who escorted them to their temporary abode, and watched them at their meals. The first duty was to build a house. An elevated site was purchased, where it was afterward learned all the bones and refuse of the Anawan cannibal feast, for years, had been buried. The natives probably thought that, when they disturbed these, the missionary and his helpers would drop dead. In building the house, an incident occurred which afterward proved of great benefit to Patton. One day, having need of some nails and tools, he picked up a chip and wrote a few words on it. Handing it to an old chief, he told him to take it to Mrs. Patton. When the chief saw her look at the chip and then get the things needed, he was filled with amazement. From that time on he took great interest in the work of the mission, and when the Bible was being translated into the Anua language, he rendered and valuable aid. The first convert on Anawa was the chief Mamoke. He often came to drink tea with the missionary family, and afterward brought with him chief Naswe and his wife, and all three were soon converted. Mamoke brought his little daughter to be educated in the mission. Many orphan children were also put under their care, and often these little children warned them of plots against their lives. In the early part of the work on Anawa, an incident happened which was amusing as well as romantic. A young Anawan was in love with a young widow, living in an island village. Unfortunately, there were 30 other young men who also were suitors, and as the one who married her would probably be killed by the others, none dared to venture. After consulting with Patton, the young man went to her village at night and stole away with her. The others were furious, but were pacified by Patton who made them believe she was not worth troubling themselves over. After three weeks had passed, the young man came out of hiding, and asked permission to bring her to the mission house, which was granted. The next day she appeared in time for services. As the distinguishing feature of a Christian on Anawa is that, he wears more clothing than the heathen native, and as this young lady wished to show very plainly in what direction her sympathies extended, she appeared on the scene clad in in a variety and abundance of clothing which it would be hard to equal. It was mostly European, at least. Over her native grass skirt, she wore a man's drab-colored great coat, sweeping over her heels. Over this was a vest, and on her head was a pair of trousers, one leg trailing over each shoulder. On one shoulder, also, was a red shirt, on the other a striped one, and, last of all, a red shirt was twisted around her head as a turban. Many stories might be told illustrating the results of the early efforts of the missionary, but we pass on to that of the sinking of the well. As has already been said, there is little rain on Anawa. The juice of the coconut is largely used by the natives in place of drinking water. Patton resolved to sink a well, much to the astonishment of the natives, who, when he explained his plan to them, thought him crazy. He began to dig, and the friendly old chief kept men near him all the time for fear he would take his own life, for they thought surely he must have gone mad. He managed to get some of the natives to help him, paying them in fish hooks, but when the depth of 12 feet was reached, the sides of the excavation caved in, and after that no native would enter it. Patton then constructed a derrick, and they finally consented to help pull up the loaded pails, while he dug. Day after day he toiled, till the hole was 30 feet deep. Still no 
water was found. That day he said to the old chief, I think Jehovah God will give us water tomorrow from that hole. But the chief said they expected to see him fall through into the sea. Next morning he sunk a small hole in the bottom of the well, and from this hole there spurted a stream of water. Filling the jug with the water, he passed it round to the natives, telling them to examine and taste it. They were so awe-stricken that not one dared look over the edge into the well. At last they formed a line, holding each other by the hand, and first one looked over, then the next, etc., till all had seen the water in the well. When they were told that they all could use the water from that well, the old chief exclaimed, Missy, what can we do to help you now? He directed them to bring coral rock to line the well with, which they did with a will. That was the beginning of a new era on Anawa. The following Sunday the chief preached a sermon on the well. In the days that followed multitudes of natives brought their idols to the mission, where they were destroyed. Henceforth Christianity gained a permanent foothold on the island. During a visit home in 1884, at the suggestion of his youngest brother, Dr. James Patton, the missionary somewhat reluctantly undertook to write his autobiography. James Patton, who had also passed from the ministry of the Reformed to that of the Free Church of Scotland, and had graduated D.D. of Glasgow University, shaped his brother's rough notes into a book which, first published in 1889, has played a great part in spreading spreading Peyton's influence. His last years were mainly spent in Melbourne. He died there on 28 January 1907, and was buried in Barundara Cemetery. Peyton's second wife, Margaret, whom he married at Edinburgh in 1864, was daughter of John White Cross, author of books of scriptural anecdote, and was a woman of great piety and strong character. She showed literary ability in her letters and sketches from the New Hebrides, 1894, and remarkable power of organization in her work for the Australian Presbyterian Women's Missionary Union. She was of great assistance to her husband husband up to her death on the 16th of May 1905. In her memory a church was erected at Vila, now the center of administration in the New Hebrides. By her pattern had two daughters and three sons. Two sons became missionaries in the New Hebrides, and one daughter married a missionary there.